Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Quint, India's first digital live streaming business news service. Uh, this is Indian Open. You're, wa you're watching Indian Open. I'm Nidhi Shah. Let's go straight to the headlines at this hour. The Nikkei posts a sharp recovery in early trade, even as global equities see their worst month since the 2008 crisis. Brent prices drop below $50 a barrel to hit an 18-month low as U.S. turns net crude exporter for the first time ever. The U.S. President Donald Trump denies any fallout with Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. And Hindustan Unilever has been found guilty of not passing GST benefits worth 535 crores to customers. Vedanta will set up a 4.5 million ton steel plant in Jharkhand via its recently acquired subsidiary Electro Steels. Well, let's take a look at the trade setup for the day. The Asian screen might just belie any kind of fears that traders have had over the last few days, but it's been, for the US markets, it's been the worst Christmas Eve ever. This is the worst. 24 December performance that the US markets have ever recorded. They fell about 2.71% and it's on a cusp. S&P finance is on the cusp of a bear market after the fourth straight drop. If you just look at what the markets have done in the last four days and this chart simplify, uh, just kind of points that out, it's been terrible the last four days for the US markets and as a result of that, about a 15.94 or thereabouts kind of a fall. I was looking at what the index or the S&P 500 has done in the history since the start of the century, which is since 2001. The December returns thus far are the second worst. The second worst in all of these years. This is next only to October 2008. So that was about a 16.94%. Otherwise, that big red screen, uh, blob that you see at the top far left of your screen uh, is essentially the returns for the month of December, which is the second worst in the history uh, for this, at least for the last 18 years for the S&P Finance. That just shows how bad the month of December has been. Needless to it, it's the worst December that I've seen in a really long time If the from on the basis of the Bloomberg data as well. So the, the US markets are not looking all that great, uh, great and the US sneezes, the world does catch cold. Donald Trump is not helping matters uh, with almost any or all of his advisors. Um, there are seemingly some issues. He fired fresh shallow as the Fed in a tweet uh, that came in around Christmas Eve or thereabouts wherein he said that the only problem our economy has is the Fed. They don't have a feel for the market. They don't understand the necessary trade wars or the strong dollars or even Democrat showdowns over borders. The Fed is like a powerful golfer who can't score because he has no touch. He can't putt. I mean, it's just, it's just uh, interesting how the relationships between the man at the helm of the United States versus the other serious advisors seems to be deteriorating and that is not something that the equity markets take very, very kindly. However, what does all of this mean for our markets? Uh, the world markets are coming off in a hurry. We're not coming off in a hurry. We'll start off lower today. The SGX Nifty may point towards a mild bit of green on the screen, but the Nifty futures ended at 10,694 in Monday's trade. So we will start off lower even though the SGX Nifty points towards a bit of green because the level that they're pointing towards is 10.635. So we'll start off marginally lower. But even after all of this, from the 2018 peaks, the Nifty has fallen a lot less than almost any of the world markets. This is the Nifty performance, 9.16% lower. S&P 500, 19.78% lower. Nikkei, 21% lower after the fall in trade yesterday. Shanghai down about 29%. So develop, developing markets of size almost everything has fallen quite seriously but the nifty hasn't now will it play catch up or will it sustain that's a million dollar question to be honest we'll get in arvin sanger in just moments from now to talk about that what could help is crude which is continuing to fall lower of course it's falling on global demand supply concerns and the fact that um, global slowdown is also weighing in but it's the lowest level that we've seen in the last 18 odd months and it continues to grind lower Let's wait and watch. Concerns over the global economy, turbulence in Washington, all of that is weighing in. The fact that US is net exporter is also weighing in. But, uh, well, India, it's great for Indian macro. This is what's happened to crude. And just look at the pace at which it's fallen in the last, uh, well, a fortnight, if you will. And the, the question really remains that, does do the Indian market watchers take this as a net positive? And is that something that will show up the Indian markets? Or will the global slowdown concerns weigh in on India as well? I think we'll get to know in moments from now or in a, in a few weeks from now. Just very quickly, before we get in our market experts, 
uh, just two or three stocks to monitor. I know we say this every day, but because Brent is sub $50 a barrel, it's very important to monitor what happens to some of the crude beneficiaries. So the, the oil marketing companies, the paint companies, the tire companies, all of these on a day like this would be important monitorables as to what happens there. Bluebug News says that Tata Motors has said that there are no plans to sell stake in Jaguar Land Rover. A couple of murmurs around this had come about uh, earlier. Uh, Tata Motors has clarified to Bloomberg News at least that there are no plans to sell stake in Jaguar Land Rover. Um, JK Cements, um, they are fundraising via QIP, floor price fixed at 732 per share, do watch out for this one. Last but not the least, Superjit Engineering, they came out with some data points on Monday's session, post market hours, saying that they expect the second half of FY19 to be very strong. Let's see if, it, and if these statements manage to help the stock in a session like today. However. Let's tell you what's lined up on First Word today. It's a collection of the top editorial stories that we believe we should bring to you. Santa Claus seems to have given global equities a miss this time around. But India has shown some resilience. So will that hold? Arvind Sanger of Geosphere Capital joins in to speak about that. Uh, there are some mutual funds that have also shown resilience in 2018, managing to outperform better than managing to outperform their peers. Yash lists them out. Darshan then comes in to take us through what brokerage houses had predicted at the start of the year and how it's panned out. Uh, and 2019 may not be able to bring any cheer for cement players. Nikki tells us why. Okay, so I, I think uh, all through the last 12 or 18 months uh, since Bloomberg Wind has been on air, we've been speaking about how people should be investing in mutual funds in a gradual fashion. 2018 will perhaps be remembered as the year when the mutual fund industry faced one of the biggest challenges, and uh, of course, and with the redemption spiking across all of the board, a fallout of the liquidity concern and some of the exposure to stretch housing finance companies as well. But then there have been some which have managed to weather the storm better. Yashupadia has drawn up a list of the mutual funds and the schemes which have given the highest returns in their respective categories. Yash, firstly, how did you shortlist these funds? Um, so basically what we've done is that uh, we've excluded any or all uh, sector or thematic funds uh, as well as funds which are focused outside India. So these are purely uh, India-focused equity funds. Now, as you rightly mentioned, it was a difficult year for equity mutual funds and uh, it, it would have been much worse had it not been for uh, the strong participation of the retail investors which showed in the form of uh, consistent SIP growth. I say this because not a single fund in its respective market cap category uh, managed to give double-digit returns on a year to date basis. Let's start with the large cap funds and Axis Blue Chip Fund. Uh, that stands out. It's direct uh, plan that has given a year to date return of 7.2%. Uh, let's also take a look at uh, which are the top five holdings and how they have uh, performed. So HDFC Bank, Kotak Mahindra Bank, Bajaj Finance, Maruti Suzuki, uh, they all uh, ha have a weightage of more than 5% uh, in its overall portfolio. Now, one name that stands out for me, uh, Neeraj, is Maruti Suzuki because that's the only name in this list which has given a negative year-to-date return and in fact Maruti is down more than 20 percent uh, so that has been one which has impacted the performance of Axis Blue Chip Fund. Uh, as far as the mid-cap fund is concerned again it's the Axis mid-cap fund which has stood out so 3.4 percent return on a year-to-date basis. Uh, their top holdings they include the likes of City Union Bank, Groove Finance, HDFC Bank uh, so a, a higher weightage of the financials. Uh, Page Industries is there as well. Uh, so a couple of names of which have done uh, fairly well, but Page Industries, again, uh, despite having a phenomenal run, it is down about 7% on a year-to-date basis. Uh, uh, HDFC Bank is up about 11% and City Union Bank, uh, that too has done well for itself. Uh, as far as the small and small cap fund is concerned, the HDFC small and mid cap fund has been the top performer, but uh, the key point to note here is that despite being the top performer, uh, it has not been able to give positive returns. So on a year-to-date basis, uh, the fund is down close to 7%. Uh, some of its top holdings, uh, they include the likes of Aurobindo Pharma, NIT Tech, uh, that has been a, been a top performer, 73% return on a year-to-date basis. But what's not done well are the likes of Sharda Crop Chem, which is down about 30%. Jumble Fertilizers are down anywhere between 5.5%. And, and uh, relative underperformance coming in from uh, Aurobindo Pharma and Sonata Software, who are just marginally uh, in the green. Uh, the last uh, category to, uh, to watch out for is the multi-cap category uh, and again is the Axis multi-cap fund. It's more or less a replica of the of the large cap fund. Uh, it has given a similar return as well, 8% up on a year-to-date basis. Uh, its top holdings uh, almost mirroring that of uh, the large cap fund. Uh, the key name again stands out to be Maruti Suzuki which is down more than 20% on a year-to-date basis.
Well, no reason why it should be different as well because multi-cap allows you to do this. But somehow access features in the list of better performing stocks, the multi-cap and the large cap category at least. Exactly. Okay, great, Yash. Thanks for putting this into perspective. Um, interesting names out there. And for everybody who wanted to know which funds have done well and which haven't, uh, Yash just brought you a snapshot. I'm sure a copy around this or a story around this will be on the site um, in a few hours from now as well. So do watch out for this. Uh, uh, what? Log into BloombergQuinn.com, of course. Uh, the next piece on first word. The year did not turn out to be that great for brokerage houses either, not just mutual funds, but even brokerage houses. So they started off 2018 with tall targets. The expectations put out by analysts at the beginning of the year were quite moderate. But turns out, even that was far-fetched. Darshan Mehta went back to the reports put out by the top 12 brokerage houses at the beginning of 2018 or maybe end 2017 to see what they got right and what they did not. Dashan, you plan to tell us about what, four of those reports today? Yeah, so we have around 12, so we'll do, uh, since there's a lot of uh, data, so we'll do four uh, every day uh, for the next three days. So basically, CLSA, let's start with the first one. Uh, they released their uh, 2018 outlook on 2nd of Jan. They said that they expected returns of uh, 10% on the Nifty with a Nifty target uh, by the end of 10, 000, uh, 11,400. So basically at this point of time, if you're looking at it, the Nifty was up just 1, 1.5%. 1 but nevertheless, if you take a look through the year, the Nifty did manage to cross the 11,400 mark and trade. Now, which were the stocks that they recommended? Uh, and, and we're taking the stock prices on the day they recommended, and we're not taking any kind of, and, and a one-year perspective till what happened till now. And we're not taking any downgrades or upgrades or target price changes. So we're taking that level uh, to this level what they have recommended if you had bought those stocks at that level and held on what would happen so on the large cap front yes if you bought all the large caps that they had recommended and in equal proportion uh, even let's say one share a share you would have made returns of six percent but on the mid cap yes they, they did bled uh, the mid caps were down almost five percent now let's take a look at uh, the stocks which they had recommended and how they managed to perform so among the large caps you know they, they managed to uh, recommend HDFC uh, the target price uh, uh, was uh, 1900 uh, uh, at that point of time and they managed to get uh, those uh, target prices ICICI Bank they managed to do well LNT they managed to do well Indusind Bank because of the entire issue of ILNFS that happened did manage to fall down in trade on an average if you're looking at the other stocks also Lupin was down in trade M&M NTPC was down almost 17% in trade the big reason why they managed to outperform was the big call sell call on HPCL in which you know they made a return of almost 41% so if HPCL was not there, uh, they would have not done well as of now. So HPCL was the big saving grace that CLSA had among the large caps. On the mid cap end of the market, CLSA had a negative return. Uh, they had a buy call on Crompton Consumer, which didn't do well. They had a buy call on Godrej Properties, which also pretty much uh, was at the same level. Where they made managed to do well was the sell call on Sriram Transport, which they got right. Uh, they got a return of 19%. And what they didn't do well was uh, the outperformer. Colgate is as a, as a record high, they, met, they gave a sell call and they lost 20% on that. So overall, uh, on the large cap front, yes, CLSA did well, not so much on the mid cap end of the market. Uh, the second brokerage that we want to speak about is Macquarie. On 1st of uh, December, they released their report earlier. Uh, what they said was that uh, the theme that they had said was they believe in <coughs> rural recovery uh, that will happen and they believe a turnaround in the housing and private sector, uh, CAPEX, that will, will not happen in a hurry. Both their mid cap and the large cap returns, if you had bought those stocks that they had recommended you would be negative 5% and negative 3% on the mid cap and the large small cap end or and the small mid cap and the large cap end of the market now let's take a look at the stocks that they had said the big positive was the HUL buy call that happened that gave them a return of 40% LNT also gave them decent return Hero Motocorp and Indusind Bank is something that you would lose money 13% down and 7% down on the mid on the large cap end of the market the other stocks uh, that they had recommended uh, uh, and uh, the, the big drop was came in in Yes Bank. Uh, they had a target price of 360 and, uh, and Yes Bank fall, fell significantly in trade. IOC was another buy call which went wrong for them. Coal India as well as Titan was did well. So overall, on the large cap end of the market, they lost money. On the mid cap end of the market, uh, let's take a look at some of the counters. Uh, Phoenix Mills uh, gave them a return of 11%. Jubilant Life gave them a return of 11%. But the big negative came in, in when they had a bullish call on NCC. Hasn't done well. NCC trades currently at anywhere close to almost 90 to 100 rupees. So they lost money 
on the NCC call. Uh, the third brokerage that we want to talk about is UBS. They released uh, their report on uh, Jan 8th. Uh, their Nifty target is 10,500, which is, and that has been exceeded. On the large cap end of the market, yes, they did well. Uh, they believe that it's a stock picker market, but the actual mid cap returns was a negative 11%. Now, let's take a look at which are the stocks that they had recommended. Uh, they did well in some of the counters, and most of the counters, most of the stocks uh, and the brokerages had HDFC Bank, had ICICI Bank, which has managed to outperform. TCS was the big uh, outperformer for them. It gave them returns of uh, almost 45% and this is adjusted for the bonus. ITC gave them a return of uh, 11%. Sriram Transport, obviously, majority of the brokerages got them got it wrong. So that was the mid-cap end of the market. Airtel, they lost money. BHEL, Ambuja and Interglobe. So basically the sell calls worked significantly for UBS and that is why their large cap portfolio uh, did well in trade. Not so much for the mid cap end of the market. If you're looking at the mid cap end of the market, what, what exactly happened? Uh, there has been pain. Aegis Logistics is down 35%, Apollo Tires is down 15%, Chennai Petro is down 35%, uh, Dalmia Bharat is down 19%. Dr. Lal was the only one that managed to stay <coughs> a little afloat. But nevertheless, extremely weak set, um, weak uh, financials coming in. Uh, from them. So, so basically these are the uh, important ones that we want to highlight. Uh, we'll come up with more tomorrow also. Okay. So next three days, Darshan will bring you up to speed with all that the broker has said and some misses and some hits. Thanks, Darshan. Thanks for that. But a very important market voice joining in because Asian markets are trading marginally higher and the U.S. equity futures are showing that as well after a volatile start to the week. Political drama in the U.S. keeping investors on their toes in what otherwise should have been a quiet holiday season. Arvind Sanger, Managing Partner at Geosphere Capital Management joins us right now on the phone line. Arvind, good having you. Thanks much for joining in. Um, Hi. Uh, you know, this is Neeraj here. What do you think, Arvind, Hi, happens over the next few days? Because it seemed oh, all bleak on Christmas Eve. <coughs> so hard to say because the market clearly looks uh, a little bit <coughs> oversold uh, uh, given how many sessions it's been down. But, uh, but uh, you know, I, I guess uh, it seems like uh, the bad news keeps piling on in terms of, you know, uh, President Trump seems to be, uh, you know, going off on a tangent, uh, ranting and raving about uh, the Fed. Uh, clearly, the government shutdown is not helping. Clearly, China economic data has not been good, so global growth is looking a little bit uh, shaky. But I think uh, at this point, <clears throat> my bet would be that we're, we've got a lot of bad news priced in the short term. Uh, so if we get a little bit more stability from the U.S. administration in the short term, uh, clearly, the China trade tensions are not going to disappear, but I think that's a more medium to long term issue. I think the near term kind of market meltdown uh, is probably a little overdone, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think we're you know, going headlong into a recession very quickly. We're clearly going into a slowdown, and there's a risk there'll be a recession in the second half of 19 or 20, but I think the market's behaving as if the recession is absolutely around the corner, which is a little bit uh, uh, overdone, in my opinion. Interesting. So maybe maybe a trading bounce, uh, and uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, Arvind, but even if that were to come about, or even if the prices, they've fallen the way they have, would you put large money to work in the U.S. markets? Or if the recession is going to come as you're predicting, and if it does come about, or if you fear that it would come about, you would hold back on the purchases? Uh, I would say that, you know, uh, uh, first of all, I don't know if a recession is going to come. Uh, ah, secondly, true. there will eventually be a recession, so you know, <laughs> we have to keep that in mind. So uh, no economy ever grows forever. Uh, right. But but I would say that, uh, you know, I would uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, start dipping my toe in the water and start buying. We have been uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, quite... Uh, position quite uh, short or quite hedged, I would say short, uh, and we are starting to depart too. And I think, you know, uh, the U.S. market uh, looks oversold, uh, and, I, and I think that with the oil prices where they are, markets like India look uh, very interesting because it is less dependent on global growth and a big beneficiary of uh, uh, of uh, uh, low oil prices, as long as, again, we're not going to a recession, but we're going into a slowdown. And that's kind of our central case right now, is that uh, it's, it's a significant slowdown, but not a recession. Okay. Uh, well, you gave me a, a toe in the door, Arvind. I wanted to ask you about India. We just did a stat this morning, not that it's any rocket science, but Nifty down about 9% from the peak in, of 2018. Mm -hmm. Everything from a Nikkei to a, you know, Shanghai to the U.S. markets as well, almost 20% or over. Should the Nifty mm -hmm. play catch up or because of the idiosyncratic factors, India might hold out? Well, I mean, I think the idiosyncratic factors can be a positive or a negative. Right now, the positives are 
uh, that India growth seems to be on a cyclical upswing. You're starting to see the CapEx cycle, uh, you know, with the private sector start to uh, turn up after uh, being missing for the last several years. Uh, and uh, domestic consumption demand has held up, and uh, inflation is very well contained, so it gives room for uh, RBI to ease, and, and, and some of the uh, NBFC financing uh, tightness seems to have that fear has receded. So I think there's a lot of things going for India. Uh, uh, and then there's going to be some short-term stimulus coming uh, from all the uh, uh, efforts by the government leading up to the election. So those are the positives. Uh, uh, the, the negatives are some of the, you know, some of the actions on short-term stimulus could have negative consequences for uh, deficit, no matter how the accounting is done. <laughs> and uh, and so that could be a negative. Uh, and if we get a recession, then it would be a lot worse. So uh, I would say those would be the negatives, but I think the positives outweigh the negatives in India's case quite meaningfully. So I don't see any reason why India should have a big, uh, uh, you know, big sell down uh, unless uh, something, uh, you know, changes dramatically either on the political or the economic front, which we don't see right now. Okay, so it will largely be global led. That, that would be my last question, Arvind. I know you have a busy morning, but my final question to you. Um, you or any of your peers or the larger houses as well, which are more passive now than active in the U.S., uh, mm -hmm. what would the first port of call be after the kind of fall that U.S. has seen? Because India is holding out or other emerging markets may not be looking as attractive as the U.S. is right now currently. Would the mm -hmm. money go in droves to the U.S. markets and some of the others? Or would some part of the global money also find its way into India and other economies which benefit from lower crude and, you know, not get so impacted by the global slowdown? Well, as you can see from the performance and the numbers that you quoted, uh, you're already seeing incremental money more going into India or less coming out of India than coming out of the U.S. Okay. So in that sense, uh, India is already on a relative basis benefited. But I think if the market stabilizes, the U.S. market looks more oversold, so short-term you could see a bigger bounce in the U.S. But when we take a medium-term view, I think the U.S.-China trade tensions and the potential for tariffs or other actions and, 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 and those risks uh, are, are higher in the U.S. Uh, oil prices are, are not as clearly a benefit for the U.S. because U.S. is almost back to being a uh, you know, neutral on oil imports. Uh, so I think India is a bigger beneficiary. And, 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 and again, as long as the uh, global economy is fine, uh, India could uh, could be more, not in the short term, but in the uh, slightly medium term, uh, be the bigger beneficiary. Arvind Sanger, uh, thank you so much for taking the time out this early in the morning and talking to us. I really appreciate your time. No, no, thank you. All right. That's the view from Arvind Sanger of Geosphere Capital. Well, uh, we could have asked him on crude, but we'll have Vanna Hari coming up a bit later on to talk about crude prices. But Arvind Sanger clearly believing that that crude fall uh, is certainly helping India. And if nothing goes too or I on the political front uh, or the economic front, uh, which he sees as a lower probability, then India might actually stand out. Is already probably standing out by virtue of the num quantum of outflows being far less than in India compared to the U.S. markets or select other markets. Uh, and that statistic is quite stunning, really. 9%. All the other markets, about 19, 20%, Shanghai, about 29%. That shows you how less India has fallen. Okay. Now, India may have fallen less, but there is no respite for specific pockets, including cement, because prices out there continue to fall. That's our fourth piece on first word. And the prices continue to fall amidst rising supply and muted infrastructure activity. A survey of nine cement dealers across different regions of the country suggests that the southern market is doing worse than the others. Nikki Merchandani is standing by with the survey findings. Nikki, good morning. And this becomes very important because cement stocks have fallen quite a bit. They are failing to recover. And there are probably reasons for the same. Yeah, there's not a single cement stock across the pack that has actually fetched positive return on YTT basis. Interesting. Uh, elusive rising power, fifth consecutive month of declines that we're looking at for cement space as a whole. All on India basis, we're looking at a one rupee cut. Might just seem to be minuscule at this point of time, but then do bear in mind the fact this reflects the kind of ability or lack of ability that the cement players are rather facing right now to go ahead and uh, take a price hike. Uh, this is for the fifth month that we're looking at cut and we're seeing a mute demand coming in from central, western, eastern, northern. Uh, but then we're seeing, um, you know, lack of muted demand for these players. But then it's the southern region which has actually gone ahead and taken a big cut because of which we're seeing the way down effect of it on all India basis prices. Two reasons why we're seeing lack of pricing power or the cut coming in for fifth consecutive month. Uh, we spoke to Sanjay Ladiwala and he said that ECC and Ambuja have been supplying more to cement dealers. Now, do 
remember the fact that it's the year end for both of these companies. So obviously they're going to be pushing up their volumes to reflect well in terms of the growth figures year on year for both of these companies. And the South Bay's players have dumped excess in other regions because lack of demand or relative demand as compared to the supply in the region makes these southern players go to other markets and exert a pricing pressure on the other players. What's hurting the southern market and what do some of the companies and brokerages have to say? Have you been able to touch base with the companies as well? Yes, we've spoken to Ramco Cement, but before that, we've been going to be talking about what's actually the factors which, according to the dealers, have been weighing on the southern market. Three key reasons that they suggest, they're looking at unstable government issues in Tamil Nadu, uh, lack of money coming in to contractors by the government agencies, and also they're looking at uh, slower approvals coming in the real estate projects, which in turn has been weighing on the prices of cement. And we also spoke to a Ramco Cement director who suggested that he doesn't expect the pricing power returning anytime soon for at least the southern players given the infra pickup in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana is seen now but not to the extent that uh, you know it could actually outpass or outperform the kind of uh, supply glut that is currently uh, seen in the markets and also we have seen in uh, we actually uh, figure out we wanted to check with few dealers if they see any kind of respite coming in in the markets Ramco denied uh, South players don't see it but then the northern uh, dealer check however suggested that they could see a price hike to the range of rupees five to 10 in Jan, given that most of the workers which have gone in December month for harvesting season could return back and uh, given the kind of cuts that they've seen in the five consecutive months, there could be some kind of hike happening in the month of January as it's also a period, uh, a good period of construction activities uh, for entire region as a whole. Uh, we spoke, we actually called out few data from brokerages to understand what's their viewpoint on whether or not uh, the price hike could be on cards. Morgan Stanley suggested that they expect overall a 1-2% hike overall in FY19 and has actually revised down their targets from 3-4% to 4 earlier. So clearly they're not seeing many res uh, respite coming in too soon. They've actually gone ahead and said that the demand is expected to moderate in second half. This is mainly on account of the pressure that the real estate players will be uh, right now facing given the liquidity condition that is across the economy. And also we, ha we, we looked at Kotak Institutional Securities which said that the hike will be contingent much on the industry utilization level and they don't see that picking up right now because the capacity addition announced by most of the players are expected to keep the utilization low at least for next two years. Well, that's as comprehensive as it can get. Nikki, thanks for putting that into perspective. That's essentially what's happening with cement. This is feedback that has come in from companies, from brokerages and more importantly from dealers across, across nine regions in the country. So, well... You should believe in this. Uh, but that brings us to the end of First Word. But a lot more lined up on Indian Open, by the way. The markets uh, are looking slightly in the green. But as we said, we'll start off marginally lower in trade. But we'll discuss the continued fall in crude oil prices with Vanna Hari of Vanda Isides. That's coming up just after this break. As cement prices decline, uh, as we just told you, we'll discuss the pricing pressure with PR Venkat Rama Raja of Ramco Cements and then a couple of market conversations too. But after this break, as I said, a full tilt towards the day straight, starting off with one Nahari on crew. What will be my contribution to the world? I wonder. Will the things I created pass the test of time? Or maybe they lay the foundation for something new. I hope my ideas survive. I've had some great ones. And there's still so much left to do. Who knows what life will bring. The road is long. The journey full of promise. The pursuit only just, just beginning. beginning. A series of exceptional stories about exceptional people whom time won't forget. Pursuits by Skoda. Coming soon on Bloomberg Quint.
This is a show which gets you a complete trap of all the stocks that are buzzing in trade. Everyone's a price taker, not a price maker out there. There are better opportunities in the marketplace. The return ratios will improve, margins will improve. What are you seeing? Valuations are extremely expensive. It would take 100 years of profits to really pay off the entire debt. Not all good businesses are good investments. Good return on equity could be expected. And I think that is sustained. Their numbers etc were pretty sluggish. How much longer they can sustain, I'm not too sure. It has never been the scenario with any of the stocks. It's an avoid for him at this point of time. I wouldn't write it off in such a hurry. We're getting into more complex chemistry. Join me as I navigate the hottest stocks and help you pick the right stock at the right time. Anything and everything about your investments. We're just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Back with Indian Open right here on Bloomberg Quint. Uh, Isha is looking a lot more stable right now, but as we said, we start off lower. It's expiry week and it, therefore it becomes very, very important uh, to look at the derivative positioning as well. And Darshan is back again to talk about the FNO setup. Darshan. Good morning, yet good, again. Good morning, yes. Uh, what we can expect is a gap down opening uh, close to below the 10,600 mark and trade. Uh, the SCX50 is indicating a positive opening of almost three points. But remember, we were shut yesterday and uh, the SCX50 was down 92 points. So uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the spot probably will be below the 10,600 mark and trade if uh, the conditions remain uh, at the level it is. Now, if you're looking at the Nifty, the rollovers is at close to 35%. Uh, that will pick up uh, as we progress into, uh, into expiry tomorrow. Uh, that uh, saying the Nifty was down almost 1% in trade. The Bank Nifty rollovers are on the lower side. It's at 22%, but that also is expected to pick up as we move ahead on uh, the Nifty expiry. Now, if you're looking at where positions are taken, uh, 11,000 continues to be the big resistance for the market. From uh, 10,700 to almost 11,000, call writers are active in trade and put writers are active at lower levels. Today also we will see, because of the gap down opening, we will see that you know at uh, 10,700, 10,800, the put writers writers will be shedding position in open interest and even at 10,600 put writers will be actually shedding position and call writers will become much more aggressive. That's something similar that happened in trade on uh, on Monday. Again, at 10,700, 10,800, call writers are much more aggressive, and at low, at higher levels, put writers have to shed positions in open interest. Now, if you're looking at where, uh, which are the stocks in the FNO band, uh, the Adani twins are in the FNO band. Jet Airways comes out of the FNO band at this point of time. The PCR for the Nifty, for the Bank Nifty, both of them came down. Now, which are the stocks that managed to move up on open interest build-up? Oracle Finance open interest build-up of 22%. That was uh, flat in trade. Siemens of uh, a little bit of fresh buying that came in. And Vigard Industries open interest build-up of 14%. That too on the long side. Now, counters with the open interest decline. You had uh, counters like ICICI Prudential and ITC which fell in trade. Uh, and Havels India <coughs> was the one that's an open interest decline of 33% and the counter was down 4% on Monday. Okay. We'll watch out for some of these names as well. Remember, expiry week, so expect some volatility and heightened volumes, which has actually been the case the last couple of days. Now, before we move full tilt to the trade, one thing that might help India a bit is crude prices falling. They've fallen to the lowest level in 18 months amidst the global economic concerns. Turbulence in Washington seems to be on everybody's mind more than OPEC signal of deeper output cuts. But where is oil headed after dipping to... Well, near sub-50. Let's put that question to Vanda Hari or Vanda Insai. She joins us right now on the phone line from Singapore. And credit to her, when crude was showing a bit of a bounce, she said emphatically, I might add, that it will not go to the $70 a barrel mark. Vanda, was a great prediction. The question mark now is with Brent at 50. What do you think happens in the near term? Uh, good morning. If we talk about the very, very short term, like let's say next few days, uh, I would say uh, it looks like uh, the markets are, are, investors are continuing to unwind positions uh, rather uh, dramatically towards the year end. So I expect uh, 
fruit to test uh, new bottoms and, uh, you know, Brent slipping below 50. I wouldn't rule that out. Uh, if you look a little further out to the next few weeks, uh, several weeks, let's say, the, to the first and second months of 2019, uh, look, the financial markets turmoil, uh, the anxiety, the, the risk aversion that we have been seeing and uh, which has been accelerating is in full control of the oil market. And that's uh, probably frustrating OPEC to a, to a large extent as well. Um, I would think OPEC just needs to sit tight because there's nothing they could do or say at this moment that, wouldn't, that would put a floor under prices, let alone produce a bounce. Uh, but go, going into a little further out, uh, towards the first quarter of 20, uh, end of the first quarter of 2019, I would expect things to start stabilizing a little bit. Interesting. Uh, having said that, Vanna, I mean, would you believe that as things stand, with the concerns around global slowdown, uh, irrespective of what happens in the near term, a level of northwards of 65 on the Brent seems a far cry or is it too unpredictable? I think a lot will depend on the recovery uh, in sentiment in the financial markets, which in turn will depend on how the, uh, on the talks between the U.S. and China pan out. I think that's a major factor that has made investors nervous. Uh, the, the tit for tat tariffs between China and the U.S. Now, the deadline for those talks, as I understand, is the 1st of March. So by the 1st of March, they should produce uh, an agreement uh, or, uh, you know, there's, there's chances that they uh, kick the can down the road and ex uh, agree to extend it. But uh, I do believe that uh, Donald Trump is under a lot of pressure. We saw overnight a tweet from him again against the Fed. Now, the Fed and what the Fed does and the two rate hikes uh, expected for 2019 is not really un in his hands beyond, you know, tweeting against them. So I do what is in his hands uh, to try and bring the economy back on track uh, for growth is, uh, is, is um, you know, giving uh, yielding a little bit on China. So I do believe that uh, we'll probably see some sort of a, a breakthrough in that, which means a bounce in, in financial markets, and that should support crude. And right around that time, I think you'll start seeing the impact of the OPEC, non-OPEC cuts, uh, which go into play as well. So together, I think that those couple of factors uh, could produce a, a nice rebound uh, in crude prices, probably at least by the end of the first quarter, if not earlier. Mm. Okay. Let's wait and watch. Ivana, thanks so much for joining in today and giving us that perspective. Well, let's talk about what to do in a scenario like this. Uh, after some time now, uh, after a long time, in fact, Amit Jeswani, founder at Stallion Asset Management, with us on the show. Amit, good having you. Thanks much for joining in. Uh, the last few weeks would have been terrible for most money managers. Uh, but how is the situation looking now with the globe doing what it is doing? Would you be putting more money to work right now, or are you sitting on the sidelines? Hi, Neeraj. Thank you so much. Good morning, and thank you for having me here. Yes, it's been a long time. We were actually applying for the PMS license, and we got the license, and we were deploying that money. Uh, see, the way every bull market and bear market is exactly the same. The bull market are all about earnings growth, and it's about how much you're going to make. The bear market, on the other hand, it's all about balance sheet quality and promoter quality. So. In, in a bear market, all market wants to chase is high quality promoters, low debt. See, there are four kinds of business models, B to C, B to B, B to G, and G to B. G here is the government. So the government businesses get like just thrown away, whatever be the case. Uh, the B to C kind of businesses, which are high free cash flow generating businesses, zero debt. Uh, so th those are the businesses that do well. So uh, for now, we are placed in the high quality side. So, so we always have a portfolio of uh, like those high quality compounders which grow at 15, 20%. So that's, that's one category that, where we have added considerable weight now. And as soon as, uh, so we strongly believe that in the next three, four months, uh, we will have a sizable bottom in all global markets. And from then onwards, India should start one of the largest bull markets. So that's basically our thesis that we are working with. There will be a leader of the bull market. And that is the leader where those leader stops will go up five, seven, ten times. So that's where you need to be placed in the next bull market. For, so for now, in the short term, it's safety of capital, which is more important, and the long term. But you have to chase that growth rate because that's where big money would be created. Okay, Amit, uh, 
so and we'll talk about where do you see potential leaders as well what pockets etc but just wondering in the near term you know we were just looking at uh, what's done well and what's not uh, and uh, let, let's let's for example talk about one usual suspect pocket which is autos which have come off and come off quite rapidly even after the falls that we've seen brokers are coming out on downgrading stocks case in point being goldman sachs on hero motor corp the day before yesterday what are you doing with the large cap auto names and i'll give you a few names to sample with because they are the most widely owned in the retail space as well or the pms space maybe the hero motor corp uh, or a Bajaj Auto of the world, a Maruti Suzuki, or Mahindra and Mahindra, at best, and Ashok Leyland. What do you with, do with some of these larger names? See, I'll tell you. I'll be, so in the auto space, first of all, I'll speak about the entire consumption space. Two, three quarters back, you could see that Symphony was reporting minus 20, minus 30% growth in sales in the India business. Then, you know, the last, if you see last one, two quarters, it's the AC companies which are reporting very tepid sales, like negative growth in sales. And now the same thing has moved towards auto side. Now, if you do a dealer check, like the dealer check that we have done, Honda sales are down at least 30% this month. Uh, Maruti sales are down at least 22% this month. So, uh, so the dealer check that we have done is not so good for the auto companies. The question is, is this a temporary phase or is this a long term phase? Only God knows that. But for now, auto is a, not a good space to be in like I would not be buying auto it's okay if I buy 5-10% expensive but I need to see clarity that am I going to see that 10-15% volume growth that the market was estimating because the markets were estimating plus 10-15% and here you have minus 15% growth and you will see the numbers this 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 quarter in all auto ancillary companies and all those larger names that you said you will definitely see the numbers coming in the orders are extremely extremely weak Wow. The question then, uh, Amit, is that, I mean, one is that we talk about the recovery and when will it come about, which is fine. The point is, do you reckon that because of these numbers, and again, we don't know whether the numbers will revert or no, so the market will only react to what the data, the data that comes out. Let's assume the data is as bad as your dealer checks are suggesting. Do you think there is a very high probability of stable names like the Marutis of the world coming off in the first fortnight of January? It's possible, you can't rule that out. See, the, with consumer names, with higher quality names, market actually gives them a chance for two quarters. In a bad quality name, if one quarter is bad, the market will make the prices go down 30-40% in no time. But in these consumer kind of franchises, there's a lot of people who are buying for this dip. So, you know, the correction in these kind of stocks are at start a little slow, but when market gets confirmation for like one, two quarters that was this is not going to grow at 10 15 percent what we initially expected you will see a markdown so that's what that might happen so that's a problem area to be honest see there are two sectors which are not doing well at all one is real estate like the the 90 percent builders out there of course the 10 percent is doing better but if re real real estate is connected to 200 industries so you see you saw the fall in let's say a green ply or kajaria or, or, or those tile names kajaria has done better but the other guys have fallen 70 80 percent in no time so so the whole building space is facing a lot of problems consumer spending has slowed down clearly and we you need to see now if this this is sustainable or what's going to happen because the valuation in consumer companies are not cheap so we're selectively still bullish on consumer companies, but the discretionary spend is what we're looking at very closely of what's, what's going to happen there. Okay. Interesting. Amit, stay on. So much more to talk about. Uh, we will talk about those pockets where investors should be positioned in as well, according to Amit Jaiswani. But before we do that, let, let's talk about the stocks in news. And our research team is here to talk about, uh, well, Amit's tepid news flow, the few stocks that could uh, react marginally in the session today, maybe some brokerage notes, maybe some key bulk deals as well. Nikhil and Dashan here with, us, here with us. Let's start off with the stocks in news. Okay, I'm going to start off with that. HUL, we are expecting that talk to remain in focus. GST anti-profiteering body has ruled HUL has made unjust profit to the tune of 535 crore by not passing on the rate card to the consumers. The comp this is against the company claim of around 160 crore. Tara Motors, that's again, we're going to be keeping an eye out on this one. The company has said it's got no plans to sell stake 
in Jela. That's the Bloomberg developer that we're talking about. Nagarjuna Fertilizers, which said that the company is in process of long-term debt resolution with its lender. And besides that, it's also restarted one of its urea plant unit in Andhra Pradesh. Wadilal Industry, do keep an eye out on this one. It has deferred a limited review report and has said that audit committee and the board of directors have not been able to conclude on certain matters. Suprajit uh, Engineering, uh, a stock with a market capitalization of around 3,000 North crore, expects that the second half of the financial year is expected to be a better one than the first half and has said that the company is open for strategic asset purchases and acquisition. Shri Cement, which has completed, uh, the, it has fully commissioned the integrated plan, three MTPA integrated plan in Gulbarga, Karnataka. We expect the benefits of this plan to start trickling in in the Q4 FY19 financials of the company. Vedanta, a big development coming in there, where the company has suggested that it's going to be setting up a 4.5 MTPA steel plan in Jharkhand for an investment of three to four billion dollars. That's a PTI report. We're also looking at a couple of bull deals where Goldman Sachs has bought a stake of a one and a half percent, more than one and a half percent in Gayatri projects and Nath Bio to the extent of two and a half percent. In both the cases, we have the seller of Kavi Global Opportunity Master. And last in the list on bull deals, we're looking at Punj Lloyd where IFC, IFCI has bought in more than 0.5 percent equity in the counter. Wow, that's a clutch of names and let's watch out for each of these. Nikki, thanks for that. Watch out for HUL in particular. Nashan, what about brokerages? Yeah, it, it'll be very thin because yeah. given the fact that most of them are off on holiday. But uh, Motila Loswal has come out with a note on Brigade Enterprises, which we they believe a potential upside of 37%, a buy and a target price of 282. They're saying that the company is focusing more on the leasing portfolio, which is a tactical shift and according to them, uh, positive for the company. Uh, the stake sale in the hotel portfolio will further fund all the future capex of the company. Company, and the residential sector will rep recover, according to Motila Roswal, and they believe that affordable housing is an opportunity. Macquarie's come out with a note on ITC. They've raised the target price to 376, uh, not too much of an increase in target. The earlier target price 367. They're saying ITC is winning back the market share in cigarette, and leading that will lead to volume recovery. Uh, they expect uh, earnings recovery to continue with the strong volume growth, and margin expansion in FMCG will lead to a valuation re-rating for the company. So that's the view on ITC. Okay, we'll watch out for these names as well. Thanks a lot, both of you. Amit, uh, a thought on HUL again, companies with stretch valuations not passed on GST benefits, so, so it's a uh, stock in news as well. What do you think? So about, see the thing is that these guys are cash flow machines. So even if they go down 10, 15%, you will find buyers here so they will they will go they will not go down on price terms the very high quality very high roc cash b2c kind of businesses will not go down on price terms they'll probably go down 10 15 percent and stay there till valuations don't become uh, like cheap again and then they'll go up again so that's that's what's the pattern for these kind of companies the only thing here is the volume growth should be at 10 percent so till the time the volume growth is more than 10 percent these stocks will not uh, trade cheap see there are only few very high quality companies and that's what you learn in the bear market that out out of five six hundred thousand odd companies tradable companies for us in the basket there are only 60 70 or 80 companies in india which are good for long-term investing rest you just have to play the cycle make money and get out because uh, in the next bear market they will not do well they'll fall 60, 50 40 60 percent and then you know so the investing class will always chase these 40 50 uh, 70 very high quality companies and they will not trade cheap in India for the next many years. Okay. Um, so even if there are some short term gyrations today and minor dips at well, if at all they come about, Amit seems to be reasonably bullish on these companies. Uh, stay on Amit, uh, so much more to talk about. It's uh, you know actually a bit late, but let's focus in on the technicals for a bit as well. Gaurav Bissa of LKP Securities joins us right now to talk about uh, his thoughts as the Chandan Tapari of Motilal Oswal Securities. Gentlemen, both of you, good morning and season's greetings to both of you and your teams. Uh, Gaurav, let's start off with you first. Uh, how are you approaching trade today in the penultimate day to expiry? Good morning. Season's greeting to your team and uh, your viewers as well. Uh, as far as Nifty is concerned, we have seen decent amount of uh, correction happening from levels of 10,900. Uh, the point to note is that one is trading uh, uh, with the cabinet opener we are expecting. It will be trading near the 50 DMA, placed around 10,550 mark on the spot side. And 10,500 production uh, contains the second highest concentration. So I think uh, we may see some amount of uh, stability at levels of 10,500. We may see a technical bounce. 
whether that lasts or it again you, uh, people use it as a shorting opportunity that's a different question but for the time being i think uh, around 10500 520 we can see some respite for, as far as nifty is concerned so for me uh, any dip towards 10550 can be used as a buying opportunity maybe you buy a january series call options that can be a decent strategy as well okay uh, chandan uh, how are you approaching trade uh, this morning is there a position that you would like to build on nifty or the nifty bank ahead of the expiry tomorrow yeah good morning seasons greeting to you thank you uh, gorav and entire team at uh, bloomberg quint uh, may uh, the new days uh, bring all the prosperity with the bullishness in the market uh, talking about the market setup uh, we have seen sharp decline in last two trading session with the concern of the global indices we have seen some uh, call writing activity at higher levels and market is again slipped to slip below its 50 day exponential moving average we have seen fresh put fresh call writing at 10700 strike and because of that now the hurdle could place that 10777 kind of level but on the downside again the support or the put writing activity at 10000 could act as a support so as of now it seems that market may see some consolidation for next one or two trading session being the fn expiry but again the way multiple hurdle are being placed at 10929 950 zone it seems that upside barrier are clearly visible in the market so as of now if surpasses 10777 then only we say we may see some recovery otherwise some lake cluster move with Uh, the testing of 10,700 or 10,550 zone could be seen in the market. Mm. Okay. Um, before we get into specific stocks, it's 8:50, so let's uh, get in our special segment, Bloomberg Edge, where in Yashu Pai that tells us about a pattern that the Bloomberg terminal has thrown up on a stock. And Yash, what's the stock on your radar today? Morning, Neeraj. The stock we are tracking is Colgate Palmolive, and a negative signal coming in on the back of a bearish, bearish engulfing pattern uh, formed on the charts. Let's first try and understand what it is. Uh, it is basically the formation of a bearish candle uh, right after a bullish candle, wherein the body of the second candle. Uh, completely engulfs the one ahead of it. Uh, the longer the size of the second candle, the greater is the evidence of a top forming. Uh, no further uh, uh, confirmation required. Now, as you can see on the chart that should come up on your screen, we saw a big red candle form uh, in uh, mon in Monday's day of trade. So that indicates uh, the possibility that uh, you know after moving significantly over from the levels of 1200 uh, to well in excess of 1300, uh, possibly these are the levels where a near term uh, top may be formed, and we could expect some downside when when it comes to Colgate. And how well has this worked in the past? Uh, so, Neeraj, the beauty of this is that uh, each and every time that the indicator has turned negative, uh, it would have given you positive returns, and and you would have not lost money. Uh, with the average hit rate suggesting a potential downside of almost 7.6 percent over the next one month. Wow. Okay. Let's wait and watch if this works. Thanks a lot for that, Yash. Well, the terminal seems to be indicating that there could be some downsides to Colgate. FMCG might be under a bit of stick as well this morning. Before we get to specific stock recommendations, Gaurav Bisa, you want to come in on Colgate? I also feel there can be some pressure. Uh, the only part is that I would be more interested uh, if it uh, trades below the levels of 1310, 1305. For the reason that uh, if you see the trend line, the upper trend line support, it comes around 1305. That's a two-year trend line. It gave us a breakout, probably a false breakout. So any dip towards the thirteen ten, thirteen zero five can be used as a shorting, a shorting opportunity. It can test levels of twelve sixty, twelve sixty five, or it can again see a much much lower levels also. But for now, I would sell. It's uh, in the weak zone. Uh, I would uh, recommend a sell at a little bit lower levels. Okay. What about specific stocks? Gora, I'll come to you first. The first recommendation today would be buy on uh, Syndicate Bank. We have seen PSU banks are doing quite well. Uh, syndicate bank has seen a breakout a double bottom breakout on daily charts uh, we have seen some of short term also coming in option activity is also suggesting it may try to test lows of 40 or uh, with a stop loss of 3660 3650 one can uh, buy syndicate bank for targets of 40 and above ubel is another name uh, that is looking a little bit uh, vulnerable uh, from levels of 1420 14, 1430 we have seen some of correction coming in the name and it is now looking uh, a little bit weak it's sustaining uh, below the push hurdle of uh, Uh, 1400. So any jump is likely to be resulting in fresh shorting opportunity. One can keep a stop of 1350, 1380, and uh, sell right for target price of 1300. Okay. Well, UBL yet another consumption name which is uh, under a bit of cloud today. So let's watch out for FMCG in the session today. Chandan, what about you? What are your stock recommendations? Yes, uh, turning cautious on negative on FMCG counter, and talking about the stock specific. Uh, first, that is buy on M&M Finance. The stock is comparatively doing well. And supports are gradually shifting higher. 
uh, it is having immediate hurdle near to 475 and above that it may start a fresh move towards 495 to 500 zone. So here I am looking for this conditional buy to buy above 474, 475 for an upside target towards 495. Second trade is sale on Hindustan Unilever. The stock has uh, broken its rising support trend line which is working well from last 8-10 uh, weeks and I started to form lower highs, lower lows and taken hurdle with the formation of the dark cloud cover on the weekly scale. So all uh, data suggests the downside could be seen in the counter towards 1735-1740 and uh, other FMCG counter also witnessing some pause in the positive momentum and turning uh, or getting the negative crossover signal on the mechanical indicator like RSI and MSCD. So that's why I recommend to be negative on the FMCG and positive on MNM Finance. Well, do watch out FMCG somehow and I didn't know about this but there seems to be a consensus on the trading side building up against the FMCG names. So that's something that you got to monitor in the session today. Okay, what else? I was looking at the broader end of the spectrum um, and what has uh, come off uh, quite a bit, not just yesterday but over the last few days and specialty chemical companies have taken a bit of a stick. Amit, uh, do you track this pocket? Uh, technically, I mean, or rather fundamentally, uh, the currency correction uh, 70, 71, 72 should be positive for some of these companies. It helps them in a big way. Even the import substitutes will benefit the likes of Deepak Nitrate, etc. The stocks are coming off. SRF, the last two or three days, has taken a lot of stick. Some of the others, too, have come off. Do you track this pocket? Any, any, any particular company that you like out here? See, we track only one company very closely. That is Aarti Industry. So that, that's doing a good job. But... See, it's a, chemical again is a cyclical business. In the, like it, it, it can be good. India can become a, a, a bigger man, a manufacturing hub in chemical. But we take chemical as a cyclical business. As long as the cycle holds, until now we are holding actually Aarti industry in, in our momentum product. So we are holding it. It's about the 200 day moving average. So I'll use Chandan's words a little bit here. But till the time this price action is good there, it never fell during the fall. It's very close to its lifetime high. Till the time it's showing the right price action, we're there. And the day it doesn't show the right price action because we don't know, you know, 35p for Aarti industry, we don't know it's good valuation, bad valuation because chemical companies who historically have traded at 5, 7 p multiple. So, uh, you know, it's a very difficult thing to say that what valuation is the right valuation. But those guys are growing well. Till the time they're growing well, I will be there in, in it and if the price action doesn't move in our favor we might exit there. Okay you know uh, interestingly Amit uh, while staples and companies like F, uh, HUL etc and you gave your view there that these guys don't require money to run the business in a meaningful way and therefore the return ratios are usually very high and therefore they'll continue to trade expensive. What about the uh, you know non FMCG but in the consumption space uh, companies. Uh, so again I'm, I'm limiting my conversation to the ones which started showing some chinks in the armor in Monday's session, a jubilant food works, a couple of liquor companies, etc. Uh, consumption, but not staples. What do you do here? See, overall in the consumption category, these, these companies, there, there's a huge opportunity size. So you need to just buy them on dips, okay? And whenever you see them down 20, 30%, and that's what we've done, actually, to be honest, that whenever we see a good very high quality, good ROC, debt. See, there is a difference between a mid-cap. When a mid-cap falls 30%, sell it. When a large cap, debt-free company, which is growing at, let's say, 20%, falls 30%, okay, it's actually cheaper by 50% because the growth is 20% and the stock price falls 30%. So that is the time you buy those companies. So Give me an what example. we do, we, we have a clear distinguished, distinguished, uh, I will not be able to take like example. It's no, not I'm not talking exactly about stocks consumer, that you bought, bought in. a gold finance company when it was down. Okay, okay, never mind. Finish your point, Amit. Finish your point. Gold finance company. Yeah, so that's that. That was one day the stock was down 15% for no reason. So that's when we just got in and bought the entire block that was there. Uh, so you know those like example like that was an NBFC which I'm speaking about. That's one space that we were long for a long time. So we've been long financials from 2015 to 2018. I would say we were like 40-50% in financials because that's where the larger growth growth was. So in between 2015 to 2018, your 
your nifty was growing at 1%, right? Like nifty EPS growth was 1%, 2%, whereas your private financials were growing at 20, 25, 30%. So that is where we were placed. Now we've cut down the weight in the private financial, but we've uh, we okay. uh, like we've cut down weight from 40% to about 22, 23%. Okay. But I'm Amit, sorry, I didn't I, actually. I'm uh, no, Amit, Amit, give going me a point. to a different topic, I think. No, no, Amit, completely fine. But I'll come back to the topic. But let me just address the pre open session. It's about to start any moment now. And I'll come back to this conversation. <laughs> Not on a different topic, completely related. But just come back to you in a bit. This is how the pre open rates are looking right now. Uh, we won't have the green, so please don't get uh, miscued by this. These are just free trades. We will start off lower. We cannot start at 10,700. This will come off a bit. Let's give these rates a chance to stabilize. What could be causing this? Well, a multitude of factors, including some free trades on large cap names. Let's wait and watch what happens there. But bring up HUL. That's a stock in news, and I just want to see if that is reacting at all in the session today. Well, marginally off, so not too much. You know, stocks like Indusind Bank have a 5% uptick right now. I think that will correct itself and therefore the Nifty have a more reasonable rate coming in. I think today it's a lot more volatile. Reliance has this 1.5% uptick. I really doubt that will happen as well. So let's just wait and watch what happens. Uh, top losers from Monday's session, the two-wheeler companies, Hero Motor Corp, Bajaj Auto, they've corrected quite significantly. They look like they'll start off week in today's session as well. Amit Jaiswani's dealer check suggests that select companies, I don't know the individual names, but that auto sales have floundered. And let's wait and watch if that continues to weigh in as we near the end of the month and the year and the, and the numbers start trickling in the first. Um, what else? Ultratic Cement has this unnatural 6% downtick. Uh, let's wait and watch. I think that will get corrected too. Vedanta, stock in news, about a percent and a half higher. I think um, not too many mid caps in news either. HL is probably the large name in focus on basis of news. And that stock is down about well, a percent and a half as we speak. Any big movers on the other side? SRF, which was down 8%, about a couple of percentage points higher. So do watch out for that. Uh, there is weakness in Thermax and Kalpatrupar. Kalpatrupar was, I think, grinding lower in Monday's session as well. Let's wait and watch what happens there. Vinati Organics looks like starting off slightly lower. Let's wait and watch what happens there too. And lastly, Jubilant Foodworks should come up on your screen. Had a fair bit of short positions being piled on in Monday's session. Very close to expiry. The stock had cracked about 6%. Let's see what happens here. Avenue Supermarts, the last but not the least. It's actually not as liquid as some of the others, but let's see if that is already trading. Well, could start off uh, another 2% lower after not having the best of days in Monday's session. Okay, um, the, uh, the currency and the bond yields, and let's see what's happening there. By and large, there seems to be a belief that the dollar might just weaken against larger currencies across. I don't know if that is playing out on the rupee today, but 69.79, there is considerable strength out there. 34 paise in the green. I don't think this has got anything to do with uh, uh, the rupee's inherent strength, yes, the crude fall helps and I think that could be the other factor that could be playing in India's flavor, favor. But I think by and large the belief is that the dollar will not strengthen with all that's happening in the US. So 69.80, I don't think anybody's complaining right now. What about the uh, crude, uh, the bond yields as well, 7.24. Again, crude price fall should aid the macro and that's not something that one should scoff at. So good going for these names as well. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, with these uh, macro themes as well. Back to our conversations, uh, and we'll get to some uh, movers in just moments from now. But Amit Jaswani was just making a point. Uh, and while we were moved on from some of the consumption related names, Amit, you uh, dwelled a bit on NBFCs. I want to talk about a couple. Uh, which are these long-term secular growth stories seemingly what have come off from the prices that they were trading at, the asset management companies. You were bullish when the IPOs came about. At the current valuations, and not necessarily the prices, but the valuations, do HDFC, AMC, or RNAM offer value? I'm not saying that you are going out and buying them or this is a buy recommendation. I'm just wondering if you find value there. See, absolutely. So. I'll, I'll, uh, so, like consumer names that we were discussing, which fell 30%, which were growing at 20 30%, are like D Mart, United Brewery. So, those stocks did collapse 30% on the fall. Now, coming back to uh, the AMC basket, 
uh, we do like what is so what happened is after the IPO the TER news came and because of that we had a 20% fall in AMC's because the profit got adjusted so like a, you were expecting about 900 950 crores of profit in FY19 for HDFC AMC that got it will happen in FY20 so that's the reason of the 20% drop in fall the business is good there is no problem in the business like It'll, the next one two quarters they might not do well they'll stay here for next one two three quarters but this is a secular business i have absolutely no doubt that these companies will give us 18 to 22 percent kind of returns for the next seven eight ten years kind of period so it's part of our core portfolio and uh, see these companies will become dividend machines so let's take an example of hdfc amc the equity of equity involved in the business of hdfc amc is 2100 crores and it has 1900 crores as cash so he's making 700 crores the profit of 700 crores that hdfc amc makes is on 200 crores so basically on these are like cash machines the dividend payout is already 50 percent and the dividend payout slowly will become 100 percent so just like an hul on all those kind of companies these companies will like be cash machines for us so it is a very long trade this is not a short trade and valuations valuations we can go wrong on valuations for one two years we never say that that is not possible to say that 30p is good for a stock or 37p is good for a stock so that is very difficult to say for anyone i think so these are like for us this is compounded now we make 4x or we make 5x in the next seven eight years ten years let's see i don't know but we will hold these stocks and we are absolutely bullish on that trade and there'll be dividend payout machines for us okay the passion with which amit speaks about these businesses is quite admirable amit jaswani i really appreciate you taking the time out and joining us today and giving us your thoughts and season's greetings to you and your team at stallion thank you so much neerat same to you Thank you very much. Uh, well, well, viewers got some ideas. Uh, um, I mean, of course, standard disclaimers. Please do check with your advisors before, or do your own analysis before you go out and buy some of these names. Okay, the crude beneficiaries seem like they're starting off on a good note. Maybe it's spoken about this in the trade setup as well. That irrespective of what the market is looking, watch out for the crude beneficiaries. Chandan Taparia, uh, three stocks. If you like any of these from a trade perspective, HPCL, Asian Paints and Interglobe Aviation. All three stocks are amongst the top gainers on the Nifty 200. Yeah, the, so the first priority will be Indigo followed by oil marketing companies. The stock is continuously holding the gains and recently it, uh, given a breakout from its inverse head and shoulder pattern which has bullish implication. Already it has started to move after forming the pattern and the momentum is clearly visible in the counter. Longs are in tech. Even after the market decline, the stock is holding the gains. So I'll continue to be with bullish stance by putting a stop near to 1140-45 for an upside move to us 1185 to 1200 kind of level. Apart from that, uh, one can look at the BPCL or HPCL. Uh, here uh, already we have positive stance on the BPCL. Now I'll wait for a small dips by putting a stop loss near to 355 for an up move to us 380 kind of zone. Hmm. Okay. Uh, what about you? Um Gaurav, uh, would you trade any of the crude beneficiaries today on the upside? The Indigo is one that uh, we have been quite positive for uh, last few days and I would stick to those, uh, that particular stock because it's uh, clearly evident as Chandan also mentioned the breakouts are still sustained, the portions are still intact. So for me, uh, that can be a good trade, one can play for 12, 20, 12, 25 kind of targets. So for me, I would be sticking to uh, you know, Indigo. But as far as OMCs are concerned, uh, there's a full limit where we can trade based on just uh, a crude impact. I would be a little bit cautious in uh, HPC and BPC at this point. We've already seen a strong jump coming in all these names. So I would use dips, but at these levels, I would avoid the HPC and BPC. Okay, but Integral Aviation certainly seems to be the one that uh, both our experts seem to be majorly bullish on. So do watch out for those names. HUL looks like starting off lower. This is weighed down by new moves, but I think the FMCG space by and large seemed weak. Chandan Tapariya's Amongst Chandan Tapariya's top calls was HUL, 1760 currently. Do watch out for that one. I'm wondering, Chandan, it's looking like starting off about 24, 25 points lower already. For somebody who wants to trade this, is it a good idea to go short at 1760 levels? I'm talking about the spot prices right now. Yeah, one can do that even wait for a small bounce. And now what I believe the stock started to form lower. Uh, top lower bottom on weekly scale after the movement of last seven eight week first time it is breaking below the previous week low 
So technically it has gone into the pressure and I think uh, one can initiate and in that scenario the stop loss will come to the uh, the closer level. As of now on the closing basis the stop loss is 1814. In that scenario the stop loss may come closer to 1800 zone and target will remain intact to 1730, 1725 levels. Mm. Okay, uh, so that's the view on, uh, well, HUL and that stock looks like it'll start off weak. What about the gainers? We won't talk only about the losers. Um, you know, Sri Renuka Sugars looks like starting off okay. We've already spoken about uh, some of the oil beneficiaries, so do watch out for those as well. And Kesoram looks like it might just bounce back a little bit from the lows, so do watch out for that stock as well. Cement by and large has looked wobbly. Uh, Kesoram was a big loser in Monday's session. Let's see if it continues to do that or could there be some respite here. Just one quick thought out here, Gaurav Bissa on Jubilant Foodworks. Uh, big crack in Monday's trade. What does one do today? So we have generally observed uh, whenever a high beta name uh, sees a strong correction in the last uh, couple of days, it's always best to avoid use jump uh, to create fresh long, uh, fresh short positions. At these levels, one, it is trading near the support of uh, 1175, 1180. So there is a chance that we may see a small bounce back from here. And the jump towards the level of uh, 12 and then 35, 1240 can be used for fresh shorting opportunities. Stop loss of uh, 1260 and on the downside, it can again retest levels of 1180. At uh, near about 1200, I would not be too interested in creating fresh shorts. Okay, not too interested in creating fresh shots right now is Gaurav Bissa. Wait and watch Jubilant Food Works, but the trend certainly seems a bit weak. It's given up all of the gains over the last one month. Minutes away from market open, let's tell you all that you need to know to stay ahead in trade today. First up, Tata Motors clarifies saying it has no plans to sell stake in Jaguar Land Rover, according to a Bloomberg report. Shri Cement fully commissions integrated plant at Gulbarg, Karnataka, with a capacity of 3 million tons per annum. Autoline Industries enters into an MOU with Podar Habitat to transfer land at Chakan. Proceeds would be used for debt reduction. In key brokerage calls, Motila Loswal initiates coverage on Brigade Enterprises with a target of 282 rupees per share. The stock looks like starting off 3% higher. Wadilal Industries defers the limited review report, says audit committee and board of directors have not been able to conclude on certain matters. The stock 8% lower. And Suprajit Engineering expects the second half of FY19 to be better somehow. That doesn't quite spur any kind of interest on the stock. But Wadilal, well, that's a stock in news and certainly looks like it is getting impacted about 8% lower. I don't know how well it is owned. The volumes are thin out there too. But it's had quite a fall from the highs that it used to trade at one, one and a half years back. Actually, so has a large portion of the market, but another 8% down in the session today. So not looking all that great. In moments from now, we'll get in Devin Choksi as well. But just before we do that, uh, and just before we get that conversation going, I think the market should be starting any to trade any moment. Let's just get to the top calls going. Also, uh, views on some of the top movers in trade. So the top loser on the Nifty, Chandan Taparia, seems to be Hidalco, 2% lower at start. What do the charts suggest? See, the stock has been consolidating in a range. However, the supply is visible at higher levels, but on downside, multiple support is visible at 210 zone. So uh, if it opening lower by 2, 3 rupees, then I'm not initiating the fresh short position. I'll only suggest to initiate the short position if it sustains below 211, 210. Because in the last many weeks, multiple times it has taken support at those zones. Okay. So don't initiate a call on Hindalco because it's already looking like it will start off lower. Gaurav Bissa, a stock on everybody's mind seems to be Maruti Suzuki. What's an ideal trade here if there is a trade? We have seen a good uh, bounce back coming in in the name and uh, I would uh, suggest that fresh shorting should be done only if it trades below level of 7,500. Till the time uh, we don't see a uh, decisive move below 7,500, you can see a small technical bounce from the current levels. We have seen a strong correction coming already from levels of around 8,000. So for me, I would wait a bit if it trades below 7,500, keep a stop loss of uh, 7,580 on the lower end, 7,350, 7,300 can be seen. Futures price sub 7,500. Gaurav Bissa would go short on a Maruti Suzuki. The spot currently at 7,488. Uh, but uh, just watch and uh, stop of 7,580, I believe, is what Gaurav Bissa said. You should hold on to. Okay, minutes away and just about a minute away from the market open. So good time to get in the top trading call from our experts. Gaurav, I'll come to you first. Your top call for the day today. 
for me it would be syndicate bank uh, the psu basket is looking a little bit interesting so for me it would be uh, syndicate bank if it trades at uh, the current levels it can see a spike uh, quite easily so you would go out and buy syndicate bank today yes okay so a long call from god of bissau on a day like this on a syndicate bank he must really be convinced about the stock chandan tapariya what about you your top call yeah already discussed about fmcg but uh, it's opening lower so i'll now be with mnm finance conditional buy and expecting it to move towards 495 and if you want to add more then can add indico as well now so what's the conditional what's the condition here in mnm finance chandan uh, i need a move above 474 475 Okay, so if it moves above four seventy-five, then Chandan Tapari will go along on an M&M financial. Maybe stay on Chandan. We'll just take in opening thoughts from you, gentlemen, post market open, and maybe discuss both Syndicate Bank and M&M financial, uh, and if there are good levels to trade them. But here's how the markets are starting off today: um, the Nifty and the Sensex, well, a third of a percent, so in line with uh, what the SGX was indicating, about a third of a percent. This is not bad, mind you, considering what the U.S. markets did on Monday or what the Nikkei did yesterday. One would have thought that there would be a big impact. Hasn't quite happened. No meltdown in India, contrary to fears. A lot of people, including, would have thought of that. Nifty Bank to just about half a percent. Now half a percent actually. So weakening a little bit, but still a lot stable than what the other markets would have been. Mid caps and small caps. I doubt small caps would have a big crack right now. They usually tend to react a bit lower, uh, slower. But the mid cap index half a percent lower as well. So the market breadth not the most positive. Heat map not the most positive market breadth. Uh, HUL I think is the top loser on news. And metals have come off. I think the global slowdown worries would keep on impacting the metal names. Maybe will impact the IT names as well. What if outsourcing goes down? I don't know if that's the fear playing on the mines. The currency is strengthened quite a bit as well, so all of that would be playing on the Nifty IT as well. But a fair degree of red on the on the screen. Not enough green. It's the oil marketing companies and Asian paints. No surprise. People would be wondering why do we talk about them in trade setup every time crude falls? Well, because they react almost every single time that this happens. So. OMCs and the Asian paints of the world are the ones which are doing reasonably okay for themselves, but a fair degree of red on the screen right now. HUL, the top loser, we'll discuss that stock as well in moments from now. But just a couple of uh, pointers on stocks which have moved quite a bit in the last couple of sessions. Maybe a couple of stocks in news as well. Uh, firstly, um, the stocks which moved quite considerably on Monday, and let's see how they are doing today. All three starting off weak. The the thing is, Avenue Supermarts the last two or three sessions has just been taken to the cleaners, two and a half percent lower now in the session today as well. So steep correction the last two or three sessions. SRF two sessions on a row big cracks, and today yet another day of about a percent and a half kind of a fall. So, well, uh, these stocks continue to be laggards. What about? Uh, Well, the crude beneficiary I spoke about uh, the large cap names, the mid caps. See, are not quite reacting, but Berger and Interglobe Aviation at least starting off marginally higher in trade, but no big reactions that have come in into these names. Uh, the Nifty about half a percent lower. Quick thoughts from our technical experts before we thank them. Uh, half a percent lower, uh, Chandan Tapariya. Anything on the index? And if you want to revisit the call on M and M Financial, would you be comfortable buying it right now on open? See, first talking about the Nifty, the market is continuously making lower top, lower bottom formation, and resistance are gradually shifting uh, lower. So I'm looking at major support near to 10,550 kind of level. So we'll wait for some consolidation to initiate the contract trade, or uh, otherwise we'll sell on bounce. As of now, as per the data setup, it indicates that trading range is likely to be between 10,500, 550 to 777 kind of level. So here, uh, wait only, or again uh, on bounce, I'll initiate the uh, positions on short side. Bank Nifty, I'm closely watching at 26.66. If it moves above the same, then here I'll be more comfortable on taking the long position. Now talking about the trading ideas, uh, actual already open negative. M and M Finance got stuck in a range, so as of now it's on hold, no action as of now. So if moves uh, beyond the level of 474, 475, then only I'll initiate the long position in the count. Okay, so conditional condition stays. Got a bit of quick thoughts. Uh, anything on the index, half a percent lower. And if you want to visit Syndicate Bank. For uh, Nifty, I think uh, any dip a little bit lower would be more interesting. Here, the chances are that it may see a small technical bounce back, but uh, uh, for me, it would be better if we see it uh, another 30, 40 points lower. Then the degree of confidence would increase as it will be trading near the uh, immediate support level of 10,550. So at that time, I would be initiating a trade not at these prices. But as far as Syndicate Bank is concerned, I think uh, one can buy here if you look at uh, the stocks that are buzzing right now. PSU banks have again started buzzing. Whether it's Indian Bank or the lower, uh, smaller banks and Bank of Bird on the larger ones, I think this can be a decent trade. One can buy a syndicate at the current prices. 
Okay, Jamin, thanks so much for Sorry. joining in and giving us those thoughts. Devin Choksi with us as well. Devin, good morning. Thanks so much for joining in. Uh, just half a percent kind of a fall. Uh, what, uh, what would you be advising your clients to do right now? Stay on the sidelines? Yeah, Neeraj, good morning. Uh, the kind of collateral losses that the global funds have been incurring due to this sharp fall in the crude oil prices is something which is uh, putting or keeping the market nervous. Almost, I think, close to $2 trillion worth of uh, losses that I think the global traders have accumulated because of uh, this very sharp fall in the crude oil prices followed by the commodity and the currency and the bond ends. So obviously, I think the collateral damage is going to happen to the other uh, asset classes, including emerging market equity, and India won't be so exception. So we are likely to see the kind of nervousness in continuing in the beginning 2019 January. So certainly, I think that is uh, putting us off. Otherwise, I think from the economic perspective and the, from the fundamental of the corporates are concerned, I think the market is absolutely giving a fantastic opportunity. Uh, economically, I think we would be in current account surplus uh, in this quarter of uh, January to March. Uh, as far as I think the uh, uh, our, our financial position is concerned, the trade side, and because of uh, the lower import bills, uh, probably I think you would have relatively better situation to talk about on the fiscal side also in the country. So these are all some of the positives, but against which I think the market is facing a significant amount of pressure. Uh, particularly coming from this side, where the withdrawal will be forced withdrawal from the markets due to this kind of a sharp fall. Uh, in my viewpoint, I think the time to do uh, to end to basically act would be to get into selective stocks when the market gives an opportunity during this fall, because the fundamentals of the individual companies are unlikely to get uh, affected beyond a point. And as a result of which, I think this would be a good time to probably uh, start buying some of the good quality stocks when the market gives an opportunity at lower levels. What do you make of the news on HUL, Devin? The stock starting off a couple of percentage points lower, stretch levels, there could be some near-term impact because they might have to, you know, for not passing on the GST benefits, have to suffer some bit. What do you make of the news? Uh, not too sure as to how much I think one can give probably I think a full impact to it. If, uh, if they are found guilty and if they are to be penalized for that, I think this would be a temporary moment according to me. And whatever the market price uh, fall which takes place in that, I think it's not going to take away the fundamental prospects in the company. So suppose if the valuations do correct meaningfully, and I'm using my words carefully, meaningfully, then in such situation, I think this could be a buy opportunity at lower levels. Hmm. Interesting. Devin, uh, I want a view on Maruti in particular. The guest before who came in said that his dealer check suggests that December sales uh, the wheels have come off the sales numbers. Uh, his check suggested 20% degrowth. Assuming that that's not true, but the growth numbers are not that great. Uh, should the current valuation sustain on the basis of the data that we have at hand? I think that I think the Maruti would probably trend a little lower, I think, from the current levels. I do agree that I think it's a good company, and I think the fundamentals of the company is remaining very strong. Also, I agree on one point that I think the one or two quarters uh, of uh, muted performance or the degrowth is not talking about the larger prospects of the company. Quite possible that on the other side, uh, you are going to see the buying returning back into the system as you go closer to the election quarter. So from that particular point of view, if you look at it, I think the buying should emerge somewhere in January, March quarter. Also, the fact that I think the uh, people wouldn't buy in this particular last month due to the model change effect that you are talking about and the new models I think which are likely to uh, get entered into the market in 2019, I guess I think the buying is getting deferred and the demand is not coming down. So there is a difference between the two that either the demand goes down or there is a deferment of the buying. In my viewpoint, it's a deferment of the buying which should probably return in 2019. So currently, if the market gives an opportunity due to all other factors, including the one I talked about a little earlier, in the nervous situation, it would be a buy opportunity to add this stock into the portfolio. Okay, do watch out for Maruti as well. Something's gone wrong, uh, Devin, with uh, consumption by and large, uh, seemingly. The market seems to be a bit nervous. Jubilant Foodworks, the last two or three sessions, has taken a lot of stake. Avenue Supermarts has come off quite a bit as well. Uh, and chalk and cheese the stocks, but on the valuation front, you have to fault maybe both of them uh, certainly avenue supermarts uh, what's your view here are you in the frame of mind of buying a quality name like avenue supermarts that now that it's falling 
or would you believe that the valuations demand some more correction before people dip in the money? I'm not surprised with this particular fall either, frankly, because I think in a nervous market situation, I think the reach valuations will have to basically start shading their froth that they had created in the premium market situation. So obviously, I think some of these companies which you mentioned on the consumption side, uh, definitely I think they were putting it a significantly higher amount of valuation. And given the growth rate, which is the normal growth rate according to me, I think if the avenue supermarket kind of company is growing at a normal rate of growth, probably commanding the premium valuation situation doesn't arise. Even though I think we do have an argument in place that I think there are not many comparables available in the market. Yet I think investor would probably decide the opportunity elsewhere where he gets I think valuation at a bargain level. So certainly I think this is uh, once again I think suggesting that whenever you start quoting at a premium valuation and if the market is on the rising side, probably all the stories can be sold easily. But when I think the market is not on the rising side, these stories can't be sold with the premium valuation unless they produce growth. Here in this case, I think the companies are not producing enough amount of growth uh, for whatever good arguments that we want to talk it out. But still, I believe that I think the premium valuations can't sustain. And what kind of moderation in the valuation would take place, whether it would be a time correction or it would be a correction along with the price, this is something which we cannot be immediately answering. But my viewpoint is that I think I would not get into something which is quoting at a premium valuation because the opportunity elsewhere is available which are equally strong but at the corrected valuation. So my downside is limited. Currently in the market investors would protect the downside and as a result of which I think they would not buy the premium valuation. That's what my understanding is. Would that be true? I mean, so the, the ones which have corrected and the downside seems to be limited, that's not in the retail space, right? You're talking about the broader markets so or are you referring to the retail space they win? I refer to the retail space as well and included in the broader market space too that wherever I think you have had the premium valuation continues then probably I think the investors are not very easily coming up to buy into the premium valuation given the overall sentiment and the mood in the marketplace at this point of time. And globally I think this is going to be the phenomena where people will protect the downside. So certainly I think the retail space is one I think where the premium valuations have been continued for such a long period of time under whatever the growth story that we talked about. But I would think that I think if the growth is at par level or subpar level, then probably you can't be commanding the premium valuation on a continued basis. Okay. What, you know, the top loser, and just, uh, they didn't just stay on before I take in the final thoughts. So I just want to mark a few stocks. The top loser on the Nifty 500, right, now is Jubilant Foodworks. That one is down about 4.5%. Okay, now JP Power, uh, ignore JP Power though. Jubilant Foodworks, 4.2% and currently the top loser. Growth Finance has come off 4% as well. Speak of premium valuations getting corrected. I think we're seeing that. Growth Finance, uh, Avenue Supermarts, etc., all of them coming off. It's clearly a sign of some money being taken off from that uh, stable as well. And as we speak, while we may have started off okay, but the Nifty is now down about 80 points. That's about a 0.76% or 0.76% correction. I would reckon that the mid caps and the small caps too would have fallen more. The mid cap index started off half a percent lower. My guess is that it would have fallen a lot more. Yes, about a percent and a half lower. Small caps would be playing, trying to play catch up to about a percent lower. So it's not turning out to be a good start. And frankly, this is how it should have been looking at what happened to the US markets on Monday. Or look at what happened to the Nikkei. Uh, agree, to each market its own. But when the world is collapsing so strongly, just slightly difficult to comprehend that we will not fall too much. Uh, Nikkei right now in the green, but otherwise in yesterday's session had fallen about 5%. Just one brief look at the India VIX as well and let's see what's happening there. About 15 and a half the last time I saw now, I mean as in yesterday, now starting off about 5, points, 5 percentage points are 16.55 currently. So the VIX is not at levels which would suggest that the market is oversold. Keep that at the back of your mind. Devin, um, um, you know, the, the financials are taking a bit of a stick in today's session. India, on the Nifty itself, India Bulls Housing Finance, Yes Bank, Kotak Bank, uh, all of these are down in the session today, about a couple of percentage points apiece. Uh, would you reckon that uh, th there would be, I mean, would you, would, would you as an investor go out and buy into a Yes or an India Bulls because they've come off? Or would there be names which would on a perception basis be safer to buy and therefore that would be the first port of call. So I think look at NDFC, look at uh, uh, Kotak Bank, 
both these companies basically i think are sitting on the prospects of monetizing some of their verticals going forward and that's where i think the argument would be that if they does happen then should one buy this stocks i think into the falling market my preference would be to do that because i see larger amount of certainty on that side at the same time i think i remain comfortable with the kind of business and the model that they have been operating so i would probably i think look at this kind of companies to add into the portfolio yes i do agree that the better down valuations of yes bank i think are looking attractive enough at now for uh, again to consider the stock into the portfolio however i think i would like to see some amount of clarity on the management side as to how this particular business is going to be run by the next generation of managers who are going to come and play their role so certainly i think that is one area where i am not having enough amount of clarity would like to get one thereafter i think one can probably confidently add them into the portfolio but as of now i think if i have to select one between kotak and hdfc bank probably i think my choice would be uh, equal on both of these companies from the investment point of view okay we leave it at that devin choksi thanks so much for taking the time out and being with us uh, and hopefully we tide over uh, this market fall Thank a bit you. better appreciate your time that's devin choksi's view on what's happening in the markets well i can tell you what's happening in the markets is a fair bit of selling that's happening in the markets good time really uh, an apt time looking at all that's happening on the global front as well to reinvite ajay shivastava md at dimensions corporate finance uh, services joins us on the show ajay thanks much for joining in i know we spoke a few days back but just the scenario of the market is uh, uh, so fragile that it's important to have these conversations again uh, are you okay simple question are you negative are you neutral or are you selectively positive in the current scenario you will find it very strange good morning to you that i am quite positive actually what's going to happen to indian market in the next year i think everything that could be wrong have been wrong in last year i think we are in a wonderful position at this point of time both in terms of the economic variable and the market structure i know there are lots of naysayers about fiscal deficit and the uh, you know this bank loan waiver etc but that's accounting entry that's not real money being given out to people you know you could have never recovered the bank loans to farmers in any case so might as well write it off in the books clean up the books in any case but all in all a great positive because i think you have a market where there are long term buyers no panicky sellers market is not over leveraged yes tremendous global uh, overhang on the market but that also triple overdone we have a low volume international market being driven down so uh, oil is where it is interest rates are peaked out in india i think should go lower uh, uh, the government is looking lot more friendlier as compared to the past you got everything going for yourself my friend this is going to be a great year for the markets i'm greatly positive uh, on this market for this year given what's the construct and the economic situation uh, but would would it be in isolation or would you believe it will that i mean so what i mean is even if global markets fall do you still think india will do well or do you think india will be a relative outperformer one i think it will be relative outperformer you know global market also let's be honest about it they had the good year, good time till the 11th month of the year december has been a massacre absolutely you should see recovery coming around at the end of the day in in the system some point of time the market will recover you know these market moves in the last one week are over exaggerated because you you know very well liquidity is very low and therefore any single selling can take up the market so badly you saw japan open yesterday at almost 5% circuit because no other global market was open all the traders are out so in No, so don't i don't think we should extrapolate too much from what's happens in this week and come into this week the whole of the, this week till the new years let us wait till we see from the 5th or the 7th of january how the market pans out i think you will see some kind of recovery coming in that's one uh, there's too much being read into the qe ending in europe that's a factor that's definitely a factor but i think you will see responses from central bankers coming down in the first week of january so if you haven't sold you have the ability to hold the shares hold it in my view because this is going to come out of it i think pretty soon i think it's been sold down too fast too rapidly in an illiquid market interesting um ajay uh, the the positive as a lot of people would believe is what seems to be a structural correction in crude prices again never say never at 84 not too many people anticipated that brent would be 50 in such a quick time but it has it could always bounce back but from the looks of things us turning net exporter etc etc we may not have a big spike uh, 
what do you do there? Because I think uh, even from a short term perspective, the July, August, September quarter results for a lot of companies on average Brent prices between 75 to 80 were a lot worse. And those companies could immediately show uh, a correction on the positive side on their quarterly performance in the OND quarter or the Jan, Feb, March quarter as well. You know, the crucial question is, what does the government do with the fallen oil prices? How much of this gets transmitted to consumers and to the industry? I think that's a crucial question. Right now, not too much has been transmitted down. That, you know, if it does translate down, let's put it this way, on actual to actual basis, I think you could see a tremendous improvement in Jan, Feb quarter. I think this quarter is over and done with. Nothing much can be done. Results will be disappointing in this quarter. You know, festive season, etc., etc., has not been too good. But I think if the government comes down to the fact, and I think it is, that's why I said, politically, the government is very known to the view that, listen, this 7.5% is actually not real. You know, we all know that. But let's do something serious to the economy because politics is important as well. So I think you will see a lot more transmission happening compared to the last time when the government came in and the oil prices fell. None of us got the benefit. It just went into uh, you know, all kind of expenditures. This time, I think with the GST, what we are seeing at this point of time, a uh, lot more focus, at least on paper, if not on action, on MSMEs, you will see, uh, and if the government takes a call to transmit lots of this reduction into the market, consumer purchasing power goes up, industry cost goes down, then of course there will be a huge resurgence in uh, you know, demand and the performance of the company. But if facing pressure on fiscal deficit and trying to hold that holy line of 3 3.5%, the, the trans cuts don't come back to the consumers and industry, then you're back to where you are. It doesn't matter what the Brent is. The What matters is what you pay in rupees. Uh, yeah, but, okay, th so that point is well taken. But uh, having said that, net-net, even if some of the benefits are not passed on, all of the benefits are not passed on, would you reckon that uh, a crude, no, uh, rather crude coming off so much, the currency uh, gaining back quite a bit, and both of these factors would serve certain tailwinds. And the, the, the other crucial question is, I mean, is it even the right way to play some of the companies or ignore these short-term noises, but look at structural changes in earnings trajectory and that's how you pick companies? Well, you know, you, you really can't ignore short term because that's what uh, kind of bothers you when you buy into investments. You know, we all not Warren Buffett's. We can look for five years. We look at our portfolios. We have positions. We have margins to pay. So I think you can't ignore the short term. I think what you can look at is the very simple fact that, you know, the government is certainly in a more amenable mood to look after the industry compared to the past four years. I think that's the given. And as you go down the path, that's one. The number two is, you know, the private equity market is nice and robust. So capital flows, although on the uh, listed side, have been negative. The positives are, is that the uh, private equity deals are coming in fast and furious, good quality valuation. You saw the deal for uh, Fortis coming through. Uh, apart from that, uh, you know, again, you know, how, I don't know how the justice system works in India. They just stopped the open offer for retail people. Now, who are you hurting? The Malaysians are already in the company. The Indian shareholders can't tender the shares. Well, I, I can't understand justice. Anyway, leave it aside. But you saw the max deal happening. You saw PVR getting stronger and saying, I want to do a 750 QIP at this point of time. So the private you saw the Swiggy deal, which is like, you know, people saying, wow, is this the meltdown which is about to happen? Because when you start pouring money at these valuations, I think you are at the really the peak of stupidity. But leave that aside. The question is, there is enough money in the system which is coming to the private equity route. All right. So which is good because at some point, even a little bit of diversion takes place to listed space, you could be good. Real estate is so good on the unlisted <laughs> side. Listed stock are suffering. So there is liquidity. There is market payment for this and so on. But Fear is, if, the, uh, the, if this uh, private equity market, given what they're doing, it kind of goes down, that negative effect could be bothersome. But for the time being, let's enjoy the ride. And let the promoters enjoy the money they're making from these fellas. Yeah, I think the people who are still invested in Swiggy will not be liking this conversation today, Ajay. But yeah, it's a, it's a pertinent point. Uh, okay, a couple of other things. Since you brought out liquor, hey, let me ask you about that. I remember a conversation, maybe last Diwali, Wherein it was a pertinent point that you made that you know everybody is having alcohol, so let's go out and buy those companies. They may not have done too much in the year thus far. In fact, as we speak, consumption uh, stocks, by and large, the Jubilant Food Works, the United Breweries, etc., all of them are coming off. What do you do here? I think you just keep adding. And I have a very simple philosophy of life. 
that you will have cycles of year to year when the stocks will do extremely well, then they will correct and then they will start to roll back. But you've never seen structurally year on year, if you look at a pattern of those these stocks, to come down. Now, Jubilant is a little outlier because the valuations are pretty uh, kind of uh, uh, aggressive at this point of time or any point of time since the stock has listed. For reasons I don't know, but it has been aggressive. But for the other stocks, I think they have a good franchise. You just keep buying. You never lose money. Have you ever lost money in Hindustan liver by holding it? No, you won't lose it. Have you lost money in Nestle? Apart from the Maggie little shenanigan happened, again, justice system of India. No, you don't lose money. The question is, it's not about, uh, you know, when they're coming down or going up. Question is, can you keep adding them up to your portfolio and don't sell them? You know, you can't recreate franchises like these at the end of the day in any country whatsoever. And India is gradually becoming a more MNC owned uh, kind of a business co country by and large. And with their cost of capital, they're this thing, they are ruling the roost at this point of time. So you don't want to get away. And can you imagine, you know, at some day, I'm not saying uh, facetiously, some day, 700 million people, 800 million people of India start to consume these products. I think it's you just can't sell these stocks at this point of time. You just have to keep buying. Don't worry, they may correct 2%, they may correct 10%. But do not lose faith in them. Just keep buying and adding. These are your retirement stocks. You know, they don't bother you. They don't fall 40%. They don't disappear like PCJ, etc. You know, they don't do so. Why do you not want to pick them? Because the risk is much lower. The returns are muted or maybe 15, 20%. But look at the risk quotient, hardly anything. So look at risk more than just the return as well. So United Spirits, United Breweries, I believe Ajay is talking about the larger ones, uh, not about the Soam distilleries or the Global Spirits. Those might be good too, but I think Ajay is not referring to those. Ajay, my, my final question for this conversation today, the last couple of sessions, we've seen some of the high value names, or not some, I mean, a, a fair bit of high valuation names come off. You refer to Jubilant, but we've seen Avenue Supermarts, a lot stable name come off, Grove Finance, come off quite a bit. Despite the news flow notwithstanding, a stock has come off. I would reckon it's a sign of some valuation corrections happening. Do you see that um, as being a part, a central theme in the next few days, a very highly valued companies coming off? Oh yes, certainly. I think the, you know it's a natural process, I think what's happening there, because people are willing to move now to the other names to get better value for the money. And it always happens in a market where you don't make too much profits in a year. You try to find pockets where your incremental alpha has to go up compared to the rest of the market. I think this is a time, you know, this year has not been a good year for all of us in equity, let's be honest about it. Maybe a few people have done remarkably well, but most have not, and all of us have not. In which case, you try to find pockets of higher expected returns, and certainly you don't believe that at the end of the day, an Avenue supermarket will give you higher return than maybe other retail stories, which are down to book value of less than one or thereabouts. So I think the play is going to be that will the valuations catch up game happen for the other players in the market. So I think this process will continue. You've already seen Page, etc. correcting quite substantially at this point of time. They have good demand. You saw Aisha correcting. It's very good demand, but still valuation has corrected. But I think this process will go on because search for yield, search for returns is going to become more and more desperate as we go past. Because in a year like this, when you don't make pretty good returns, you try to balance it off in the next, in the last financial year of India is concerned. So I think this Jan, Feb, March, you'll see more of that happening. People switching portfolios to other stocks to see the expected return can be higher. Well, let's wait and watch. Uh, Ajay Shivastava, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us on such short notice. Really appreciate your time. Thank and you season's so much. And season's greetings to you and your team. You're welcome. That's thank the, you. Same to you. Same to you, all of yours, please. Thanks thank so, much, so much, Ajay. That's a very important voice and some important thoughts as well coming in from him. Let's take a break on that note. A lot of market conversations. By the way, the markets are now at the lowest point of the day. So the optimism notwithstanding, we are down about a percent. Uh, maybe par for the course as well. The mid caps and the small caps have fallen more. And the market breadth is not looking all that great. So I'm guessing it's not looking all that great for cement prices as well because they've come off. And as cement prices decline again, we discuss the pricing pressure with PR Venkat Ramaraja of Ramco Cements. He joins us on the other side. Stay tuned.
anything and everything about your investments. We're just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. This is a show which gets you a complete trap of all the stocks that are buzzing in trade. Everyone's a price taker, not a price maker out there. There are better opportunities in the marketplace. The return ratios will improve, margins will improve. What are you seeing? Valuations are extremely expensive. It would take 100 years of profits to really pay off the entire debt. Not all good businesses are good investments. Good return on equity could be expected. And like I think that will sustain. Their numbers etc were pretty sluggish. How much longer they can sustain, I'm not too sure. It has never been the scenario with any of the stocks. It's an avoid for him at this point of time. I wouldn't write it off in such a hurry. They're getting into more complex chemistry. Join me as I navigate the hottest stocks and help you pick the right stock at the right time. with Indian Open right here on Bloomberg Quint. Cement prices have slipped for the fifth straight month in December. Bloomberg Quint's dealer check indicates that this trend may hold for some time now with slower approvals and delayed government payments adding to the pressure. Nikki Mitchendani had a chat with PR Venkat Rama Raja of South India-based Ramco Cements. He started off by asking about the impact of GST Council's decision to retain cement in the highest 28% bracket. Let's listen in. I think uh, it really doesn't matter from a cement company point of view, but from the economy point of view, yes, it's important. But from our point of view, I think it will have a limited impact because the industry has been used to it for more than many decades. At this, It's not a new thing. We have been paying this kind of taxes for many decades now. If it comes down, yes, we will certainly pass it on to the consumer because uh, of intense competition, prices will certainly come down to the consumer. All right. The second question that I have for you in that case is, sir, a little bit about your pricing because in southern region for second consecutive month we've seen a price cut coming in. Do you at any point of think, a point of time, think that a GST cut can further limit the ability of the companies operating in a region like South uh, to go ahead and cut uh, hike prices in any way? Uh, that doesn't matter. No, it's not about a price increase. It's about uh, what are the margins you get over your costs. So if, if we can maintain the margins, I mean, that's good. And any price increases towards covering our costs so that we can maintain our margins. That's the basic thing. So I don't think uh, maintaining margins or has anything to do with the GST. After the expansion that the company has announced to the tune of more than 3,000 crore in the Greenfield unit in Andhra Pradesh and also Brownfield expansion in uh, the other two states which is expected to be completed in 24 months. I'd like to understand basically how would the company be funding this acquisition and also how would the dynamics of the company change in that particular geography where it's planning the expansion? So actually the dynamics were really not changed because we have been developing markets in the east of India and basically uh, our new lines are basically going to be con concentrating on uh, marketing on the east of India and, uh, and and the new plant we are putting actually will actually substitute for the cement production lost to the south with this new new line so that's the basic idea so the our dynamics of markets may not really change we are just catering to the growth and what and the markets we have established. That's the main uh, reason why we are thinking. And we're going to fund it mostly from internal accruals and a little bit of borrowing. So at the end of uh, our expansions in the next two, three years, we expect to have the same borrowing levels as before. 
All right, sir. So I'd like to know a little bit about the margin front. Uh, given that the cost pressures for the industry as a whole seem to be ebbing, uh, I'd like to understand if you could put a number to the EBITDA per ton kind of a figure that we're looking at. Not exactly the number, but at least a, a northward to a particular figure that we're looking at for this quarter, which is expected to be better than the first half, if at all. So that will be that will be something which I cannot uh, say no because that has implications in the market. But all I can say is, uh, you know, the pricing pressure is there and also the cost pressure is there. But as a company, it's our duty to make sure that despite all this, how can we reduce the margin pressure? I mean, that's the basic thing, and we are working on that. All right. So, so the last question in that case I'd have, sir, uh, are there any specific plan that, that the company has in mind to reduce the cost inflationary pressures that the industry or the company is facing right now? Yes, of course. I mean, that's the basic uh, idea, no? I mean, uh, of all companies. List Basically, them out, if you could just list them and whether or not it would, it would fructify in this quarter or we could see the benefits coming in from the next quarter onwards and also to what extent can we expect the benefits to creep in? No, I think it's not about this quarter or next quarter. Basically, our effort has been continuous there. It's a continuous effort over many years of how do we incrementally keep on chipping away at costs. I mean, more like, you know, incremental improvements in our cost structure and and things like that. So that effort is continuing. And and the newer technologies are coming in, waste heat recovery and so on and so forth. So all those things will slowly get into the uh, uh, our cost uh, uh, benefit. Uh, and that's uh, some of the capital investments are going on to these things. So over the years, we hope to at least keep the margins as we are going or reduce the impact in our margin decline with the increase in price. All right, sir. And also, uh, yeah. please go ahead. And also, basically, with the opening, of, and also with the opening up of of the sea routes and waterways and so on and so forth, we can also market uh, further uh, further distances and not lose too much margins. And also, as you see, the petroleum prices are coming down. Therefore, fuel costs will come down. That's the whole, whole global thing which every company will benefit. So that's also there. All right, sir. So the last question that I have for you is, uh, sir, in the first two quarters, we've seen the company maintaining the EBITDA margin in the range of 25 to 24 uh, percent. Can the same be expected in the second half of the financial year, sir? Can we expect a 25 percent level sustain or can we expect a northward figure to that? Yeah, we are trying hard. That's, I mean, that's the whole effort of the management. How do you try to keep it despite falling prices and increase? But whether that will happen or not, we'll only know in the end of the quarter once uh, we, all the figures come in. All right. So, so it is, uh, okay. All right, sir. Thank you so much. Any for other questions? No, sir. That's all that we have for you. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Indeed, a pleasure talking to you.